Hi guys, welcome back to another virtual visit to Manor Farm. This week, we're gonna start off by learning a little bit about hay and haylage. It's what we feed these ponies and sheep when they're not grazing out in the field. This is hay. It's made from grass and it's what the horses and other animals like to eat when they're not grazing in the field. There are four stages to making hay. The first one is when the farmer goes out into the field and mows or cuts it, a bit like when you mow your lawn at home, but on a much bigger scale. And then he's left with big, long sections of cut grass that need to dry out. So the second stage is to go and ted or turn it, which is fluffing it up to make sure it all dries out nice and evenly. The third stage is raking it so that that nicely dried hay grass can be raked into big long windrows ready to be baled. And the fourth and final stage is baling, where they go around with a baling machine, which sucks it up and makes it into these lovely rectangle or sometimes big round circle shapes, ready to pop on the back of a trailer and feed to the animals. This here is haylage. You may often drive past fields of these bales where they look like they're sort of wrapped in giant bin bags, sometimes green, often black. I've even seen pink ones. But what it actually is, is hay that hasn't been allowed to fully dry out. And when it's still quite moist, the farmer goes and he wraps it round and round and round, airtight in this sort of wrapper, so that inside the hay then ferments a little bit. And what you're left with is a really delicious, nutritious meal for a horse or another animal that isn't going to get dusty over time. And because it's airtight, it lasts really quite a long while until you open it. And then when you open it, you have to use it very quickly. Now we're gonna head over to my lovely neighbor, Farmer Dan at Hurst Farm to have a look at how he makes hay. He has a business called Hurst Haylage. And so it's his job to make the very best hay and haylage. He's a brilliant person to take a look at just how it's done. Hi, it's Dan from Hurst Haylage. Come and see what we do. Let's join Farmer Dan heading out into the field to turn and fluff up his hay. Now we're back at the farmyard where they're taking out more machinery. Here's a forklift with a flatbed and some equipment. What's coming next? It's a tractor with a baler attached on the back. And behind that, another tractor with a haylage bale wrapper. And another one. And finally, one more tractor with a flatbed trailer ready to collect up all the bales. It's a family affair at Hurst Farm. Here's Farmer Dan's dad, Farmer Ken, busy baling. Now we're back for one last visit to the yard where Farmer Dan has all his bales loaded up on his big lorry and he's off to deliver them all to some hungry animals. Bye Farmer Dan! Hey everybody, Neighbour here. I've just been for a little walk with Ellie and I'm trialling wearing these sunglasses so I don't get noticed by so many fans. They do make a fuss for autographs which makes it difficult to social distance. Anyway, I'm here with another marvellous mystery animal. I've got a corker for you this week. I'm going to give you three clues and at the end of this video, Hannah will reveal the animal to see if you got it right. Here we go with clue number one. We are 
very intelligent animals and we have an amazing sense of smell. We used to sniff out mushrooms growing in the roots of trees. How amazing. Clue number two. Our squeal is so loud, it can actually be louder than the noise of a jet engine. <gasps> Astonishing. And my final clue, clue number three. We are so clever that our babies know their own name by two weeks old and the mummies sing to their squeaky little babies when they're feeding them. Amazing. Now I'm going to send you back over to Hannah and the children who have an interesting science experiment for you. Bye! Hello guys, today we're going to do a science experiment. What you're going to need for this experiment is a plastic bottle, vinegar, bicarbonate soda and red food colouring which is optional, you can use ketchup for instance. We're also going to include some history of the destruction of Pompeii! Darling, don't you think this would be the perfect place to build our beautiful Roman city of Pompeii? Well, it does seem to be at the foot of the great Mount Vesuvius, which is a live volcanic mountain. I'm sure it won't erupt on us. Come on, let's tell all our friends to settle here. Oh, isn't this absolutely marvellous? What a glorious life! We're just sitting around all day, playing chess, drinking, eating and having a jolly good time. I just got a bad feeling about today. today we're going to do project number 35 make a dream catcher native americans believe that webs of natural fibers hung near your bed help to capture all the bad dreams so that when you fall asleep at night your head is only filled with the brilliant good dreams these are super easy to make and all you'll need is a bendy stick I've got a bit of hazel here, and if you pick it fresh, it's normally bendier than if you pick an old stick up off the ground that's gone a bit brittle. I've also got some turkey feathers that I've collected up to decorate mine with, and then the natural twine to make the webby bit in the middle. The first thing you need to do is bend your hazel into a nice circle shape, and then sort of wrap it and weave it around so that it stays in place. Don't worry about snapping it a few times to get a good circle. Next, I'm going to start making my web. So I'm going to tie the string onto the top and then start weaving around and around. Next, I'm going to use another bit of string to attach a nice long turkey feather for decoration. 
you can attach as many as you like, really. And if you don't have feathers at home, and you can't find any lying around in the garden, you could use other sorts of natural things, shells or little wooden buttons or anything like that. You also need to attach a little bit of string for hanging your dream catcher up. Here's my finished dream catcher. Why don't you have a go at home? Sweet dreams, everybody. Hello children, my friend Amelia has asked me to tell you how hot us sheep get under our woolly coats in this lovely warm weather. Well, our wool is actually marvellous at maintaining our body temperature. As long as we only get sheared once a year, we grow just the right amount of wool to remain in the thermal neutral zone. This means our bodies are protected by our wool a bit like a thermos flask. If you put cold water in a thermos flask, it stays cold longer. If you put hot water in, it stays hot longer, thanks to the insulation. So my body and blood stays at just the right body temperature thanks to my wool keeping me cool in the summer and warm in the winter. I hope that answers your question, Amelia. Hello, everybody. My friend Dylan has asked me if there was one lesson I could teach you humans, what would it be? So I'd like to start by telling you a little story about the most wonderful human of them all, a great man who was called Sir Peter Scott. He dedicated his life to saving my feathered friends. He particularly loved some wonderful, peaceful little geese called the Nenes. The Nenes lived happily for many years on a little island called Hawaii. They were very peaceful and friendly and because they had no predators, they would waddle up to people and other animals and say hello and they lived a brilliant life until one day European humans came to the island and brought with them ferocious predators like dogs and mongoose and even ferocious pigs and very quickly they ate and killed the wonderful friendly peace-loving little Nene until there were barely any of them left. So around 70 years ago the wonderful Sir Peter Scott travelled to the island and he saw what was happening and he rescued some of those geese and he took them back to his nature reserve in Slimbridge, just next door to Manor Farm, so that he could care for them and help them lay eggs and have babies. Unfortunately, he didn't realise he'd chosen two girls. Whoops! So they weren't going to have any babies. So he had to travel all the way back to the island to get a boy goose. And after a successful visit, and a brief romance, lots of baby Nene geese were born and reintroduced to the island. And today they're doing really well. So the lesson I would like to teach you humans is think before you act. All actions have consequences and some of them aren't very good. Before you decide to go and take over some beautiful, warm, sunny island. Think about the things that lived there before you did and make sure you're keeping their environment just the way they like it. 
And this doesn't just count to wonderful warm islands, it also works at home. Even if you're deciding to spend the day whizzing around your garden, maybe take a look under piles of leaves and in quiet little corners and make sure there isn't any wildlife that you might be going to disturb. If you were going to disturb it, shh, play a little more quietly or maybe somewhere away from that creature's home. I hope that lesson's been valuable. Bye, children. It's time to reveal this week's mystery animal. Did you get it right, guys? It was a pig. I hope you're enjoying all the sunny weather and we'll see you again soon. Please remember to like and subscribe. Mm.